I'm Eugene Patterson and I'm the Business Development Manager at E.ON. Today, we have the Head of E.ON Drive and Vehicle to Grid, Darren Gardner. Today will be our final webinar in Making Net Zero series and we'll be focusing on how you can address Scopes 1 and Scope 3 emissions to decarbonising your fleet. We will also explore benefits and challenges for future technologies and focus on electric vehicle charging and provide a lowdown into integrated vehicle to grid solutions. I would now like to hand you over to Darren Gardner, the head of Eon Drive and Vehicle to Grid. Thanks, Eugene, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and again, a warm welcome to the final webinar in our Net Zero series. The other five webinars have covered a range of topics from solar to heat pumps, and they can be found on the webinar page on our website. So whether you're a business, a city official, or even a student, then we hope that you find these webinars useful in achieving the bigger purpose of improving our air quality and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. My name is Darren Gardner and I'm the head of E.ON Drive and Vehicle to Grid in the UK. And at E.ON Drive we want to improve the air, one kilowatt hour, one charging point at a time, which includes our own commitment to electrify our fleet by 2030. The aim of this webinar therefore is to talk about how you might decarbonise your own fleet. We'll talk about some of the big policies not least of which is last week's 2030 announcement. And then we'll walk through some of the challenges we have come across when supporting our own customers' transition to electric vehicles. So, the Paris Agreement in 2015 was a game-changing moment. 196 countries, including the United States, committed to limiting global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And what came with that commitment was not only cross-country collaboration, new policies, but also hard cash. And since then, the UK government has made its own legally binding target to cut its own greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. In fact, on a local level, we've seen climate emergencies declared by local authorities, left, right and centre, with many aiming to be net zero by 2030. Now, of course, transport remains the highest polluting sector. And driven by the Paris Agreement, the UK government launched the Road to Zero strategy, a strategy to achieve net zero carbon transport emissions by 2050. So a number of levers form part of that strategy. Clean air zones, building regulations, benefit in kind tax rates, grants, grants and more grants. But of course, the biggest lever of them all is the ban of new sales of petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. And now in the midst of a pandemic when consumers are more environmentally conscious than they ever were before, we find that the eyes of the world turn to a different city, this time to Glasgow, which hosts COP26 next year. The world leaders will gather in Glasgow and the need to deal with climate change is even more urgent, if for no other reason as a mechanism to ensure economic growth. The question, though, is not can we maintain the Paris Agreement, not can we match their vision, but can we go one step further? Now, transport then is, as I say, the biggest carbon criminal when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. And buildings, of course, are up there too, but we've seen steady falls in greenhouse gas emissions since 1990 levels across residential and commercial real estate. The introduction of better design standards such as Passive House and Briam, for example, combined with initiatives to retrofit our own existing housing stock, have all driven down emissions from our buildings. So whilst buildings remain a challenge, it's a challenge that we are well face to meet. Transport less so. So transport overall represents 28% of our UK greenhouse gas emissions. And cur curiously enough, those emissions have only fallen 1.4% in 2018. 
and they've only fallen 3% since 1990 levels. So how are emissions broken down? Well, there are different scopes that we're concerned with. Scope 1, scope 1 emissions are those emissions that are under your direct control. And the big one here is most likely the fuel that you use to operate your fleet with. So electrifying your fleet will have a big impact on your scope 1 emissions, since you won't be using as much, if any, of uh, the traditional petrol or diesel fuels. So that is a very quick win indeed. And of course, that could, though, increase your scope 2 emissions, which relate to your energy supply. So this could be a problem for the UK, but less of one uh, now that we've stripped out coal and that we've uh, really enabled renewable, distributed and decentralised energy generation such as solar uh, and the like. But from a fleet perspective, it would be worth noting that if you don't have either on site renewable generation or 100% renewable electricity supplied by your supplier, then obviously your scope two emissions could well increase for your business. If we think about cleaning the air, there really is no point electrifying our fleet if it is still to be uh, powered by uh, fossil based energy. So scope three emissions are those other emissions not under the direct control of your organisation. But nonetheless, you may wish to account for those emissions as part of your wider impact uh, on the environment. So, for example, what is your supply chain doing to electrify their fleet? For companies such as uh, E.ON and, uh, and big fleet operators, then we have a very prominent leadership position in that regard. And we're using, for example, our size and our voice to, yes, lobby the government, uh, but also to encourage our supply chain to decouple urbanize its fleet. Some of the mechanisms then that we found uh, that we've been able to, 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 deploy, to deploy have been things like sustainable procurement policies uh, and just generally good supply chain audit and good supply chain management practices too. So why have greenhouse gas emissions from transport only fallen by 3% since 1990 when vehicles have become more, more fuel efficient and fuel has become cleaner? Well, one thesis, of course, is that we are simply driving more. One city that we have worked with for some time has an average commute of three kilometres. Yet two out of three residents use a car for that commute. So if we really, really want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our cities, then we need to reduce our dependency on the car. Embrace cycling and walking. We should embrace car sharing and public transport and maybe we'll even embrace the e-scooter but one thing is for sure if we really are to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions then our dependency on the car needs to increase perhaps over time we'll see an increase in car sharing perhaps car ownership will be a thing of the past in the years to come that said though the UK government does love, uh, does recognise our love of the private car. We love it, uh, but we also know that the automotive sector is a source of employment. It's a source of economic growth and it's part of our UK brand uh, abroad. So as part of the road to zero policy, the government initially set a date of 2040 to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles. Well, this certainly focused the mind of the manufacturers and the early adopters in the market and charge point operators like Eon Drive. And we saw more and more electric uh, models being introduced to the market. And we've seen the rate of battery electric vehicles grow exponentially over the last 12 months. Uh, the last figure from SMMT uh, would seem that it's been a year on year growth rate for BEVs of 196%. But 2040 really wasn't good enough and that was uh, reduced to 2035. The companies like ours, and, and no doubt like yours too, have been pushing for 2030. So we're really delighted with the announcement to, uh, to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. And in reality, it means uh, for companies like yours and like ours, uh, with uh, fleets of all shapes and sizes, that you need to 
acts now. And so uh, company car policies are probably the quickest of wins here. Uh, a cash allowance scheme supported by uh, battery electric vehicle salary sacrifice is also another option uh, for those uh, people that want to leave a company car scheme for whatever reason. Um, and with three year life cycles on average for, for vehicles, for cars in particular, that's something that I think can be implemented today. And within three or four years then, it's quite possible to convert your electric fleet uh, to electric, uh, to your fleet to electric only within that period of time. And the benefits are clear, reduced carbon emissions, lower benefit in kind uh, for, uh, for colleagues, savings in employers' national insurance uh, for businesses when they introduce a salary sacrifice scheme, and overall a lower total cost of ownership for the fleet manager for the business, but also a lower total cost of ownership uh, for the individual driver. Uh, like commercial vans are though a bit more of a challenge depending on your trip profile and your payload. But again, with average lease lengths of around four years, it's possible to convert your uh, light commercial van fleet to electric. So that's very, very good news. And when you put this policy in the mix of clean air zones, uh, building regs uh, changes, the benefit and kind tax changes, um, more consumer choice, better batteries, uh, cheaper running costs, then it's no surprise that we'll all be driving electric uh, within the next three to four years. Uh, we've been waiting for this moment for some time and I'm pretty confident now to say that the tipping point in this market has arrived. So whether you are operating a company car fleet, a light commercial van fleet, uh, whether you are a, a last mile delivery organisation or even a taxi driver, then uh, for us it's pretty, uh, we're optimistic that it's possible to convert uh, your fleet to electric within the timescales stipulated by this legislation. But what if you're a bus operator or operating a heavy goods fleet? The answer is certainly less obvious. Yes, it could be a series of batteries combined with super fast charging, uh, but perhaps it's more likely that hydrogen will play its part in decarbonising that part of the transport sector. Certainly more thinking and more work to do in that space. For now though, the focus is on our cars and light commercial vehicles for the majority of fleet operators. And with collective effort and a fair wind, it should be achievable for most fleets to reduce their total cost of ownership and their carbon emissions by 2030. And, uh, we will have electrified our own fleet by then too. So in the UK, uh, we, um, uh, uh, we, we certainly uh, have ambitions to uh, be uh, CO2 free by 2040. Uh, so the objective is to be net zero and that's something that we uh, as a company feel. We feel it from a commercial perspective, we feel it from a customer perspective, perspective and we also know that our colleagues want it too. So we're really um, uh, pleased, we were really pleased to announce to the markets recently that we will be CO2 free by 2040. Uh, and we'll reduce our own scope one and two emissions um, uh, by 2040, uh, by 75% by 2030 and 100% by 2030. Uh, scope three emissions, uh, though, are going to be more difficult. But as I say, through good sustainable uh, practices, uh, procurement practices and policies, uh, we'll be able to reduce our scope three emissions by 50% by 2030 and entirely by 2050. So as part of that, we'll, uh, we'll go for carbon neutral buildings by 2030. Um, but we'll also, as I say, we'll have electrified our own fleet uh, by 2030. So in the UK, uh, we began that journey about 12 months ago, initially by converting our company car uh, fleet to battery electric only, uh, no no petrol hybrids at all in there, uh, just purely battery battery electric only. Um, and then within about three years, once the natural uh, lease, all those leases have naturally expired uh, within our company cars, then the company car element of our of our fleet will be entirely electric. Um, clearly, we have a cash allowance scheme as well, um, and to uh, 
to ensure that uh, those cash allowance drivers uh, also choose electric, we've introduced a, a battery electric vehicle salary sacrifice scheme, enabling our people and their friends and families to drive a battery electric car, meaning that they'll benefit from the tax and national insurance savings whilst reducing their impact on the environment. And certainly we're um, seeing that more and more coming into the market as we talk to our customers. So uh, two things around cars is um, convert your company car scheme to 100% battery electric only. Clearly cash allowances are here to stay, um, but support that with a really great sac salary sacrifice scheme, uh, enabling those uh, colleagues to uh, choose battery electric. So that's cars. Uh, what are we doing in terms of light commercial vans, which remain a challenge to us, but also to um, uh, fleet operators like us? Uh, so we're committed to electrifying our light commercial van fleet by 2026. Uh, we're undertaking a trial at the moment uh, with certain types of electric vans to work out uh, what the impacts are from a customer, colleague and commercial perspective. And uh, we're also sort of trialling and looking into things like vehicle to grid and time of use charging. And also, how do we help uh, our colleagues charge at home, charge at work, charge on the go and figure out um, expense management and all the rest of it. So, um, so that's what we're doing in terms of light commercial vans. Uh, and of course, we're a member of EV100, uh, which I know many of you are too. Uh, so that's a commitment to electrify our fleet by 2030. It's a commitment to be CO2 free and to operate 100% of our electric fleet. So that's what we're committed to. Um, and it's that commitment uh, combined with running a large fleet ourselves that helps us uh, help our customers overcome the challenges that they face in transitioning to EV. Over the next few slides, we'll address some of the common questions and challenges we hear from our customers. But if you don't cover, if we don't cover off all of those specific questions, then just as a reminder, there's a Q&A at the end of this presentation. So please do store up your questions. So first question that we get commonly asked is, what type of charging does my fleet need and what time of the day should it charge? Uh, this is a common question that we always get asked and it's really easy to fall into the trap of I need the quickest charging infrastructure possible, which by definition is usually the most expensive too. It's really important though <clears throat> to understand what type of fleet uh, you are operating. For example, is it mostly cars? Do you have light commercial vehicles? Uh, are you into last mile delivery? <clears throat> uh, how many miles do you drive on average? And so on and so on. And it's also important to understand it from a people point of view too. Uh, will your fleet uh, need to charge in people's homes? How do you deal with expenses? How does a driver charge at home, at work and on the go? Are there any tax or contractual considerations too? And those are all sorts of things that we help uh, our customers uh, figure out. Um, at home, uh, a simple seven kilowatt charging point will suffice. And certainly our uh, business customers uh, are, are asking us to provide home charging uh, for their fleet. Uh, a home charging point, a seven kilowatt charging point at home uh, will charge your car or van typically overnight within eight hours and they're cheaper to install and easier to maintain. Um, and this type of charging point can also be used at your place of work too, depending on how you operate your fleet. So for example, if you're a uh, hotel, uh, a seven kilowatt charging point will be perfectly fine for your staff and for your guests um, particularly if they're charging overnight. Or if you're typically parked at the office, um, perhaps you're a small firm of accountants and you arrive at the office at eight o'clock in the morning and you leave at half five, six p.m. Um, of an evening, then uh, you don't need a fast charge. All you need to do is, um, is just a, a simple seven kilowatt watt hour charging point and six to eight hours later, you'll be fully charged and ready to go back home. Or even you're a, a large uh, fleet provider and perhaps you're, you're a back to base fleet and that charges overnight or even a car park operator, a long stay car park, for example, those types of um, environment really lend themselves well to a seven kilowatt 
uh, charging point. Uh, so again, the temptation is to say I need a really rapid or really super fast charging point, um, but they're generally very expensive pieces of kit and come with really huge uh, grid costs as well. So depending on how you operate your fleet, um, depends on what type of charging point you need. And so far our experience has been that seven kilowatts uh, does uh, quite a lot of, of the job, but uh, quite a lot of our business customers also choose uh, 22 kilowatt charging points, which um, are capable of charging your fleet within sort of two to four hours. Now often uh, the types of customer here that choose this type of fleet is perhaps um, perhaps a larger corporate or it's a, an organization that has a mobile fleet. So, um, so for example, a sales force that drop into the office perhaps for a couple of hours and then need to go back home uh, and perhaps they've got a 100 mile or 200 mile commute. And we find uh, that a 22 kilowatt hour charger point is great for those types of fleets. Or if you've got um, a, a real sort of customer operation and you've got customers coming in, you may want to provide a, a quicker charging experience uh, for your customers. So we generally find that those types of organisations um, need a, a faster charge, a 22 kilowatt. Now there are uh, certainly um, uh, occasions and perhaps we'll see more of this as the government uh, introduce funding for rapid and super fast charging. Um, there certainly are occasions where you might need a, um, a, a super fast or a rapid charge. So for example if your light commercial fleet uh, is out and about and uh, is uh, needing to charge up on the go in a public destination or perhaps you're a taxi driver and you, uh, and, and you operate a fleet of taxis then certainly you'll need regular, rapid uh, and frequent charging. Uh, and of course, there are those going to be those occasions where there will be a distress purchase where we've simply run out of charge and, uh, and we need to charge up quickly. So all in all, we need a mixed blend of charging. I think 85% uh, of charging sessions will be able to be covered uh, by home and what we call work 22 kilowatt charging um, assets. Uh, but clearly there will be a need for faster and uh, rapid charging uh, on the go. But uh, you'll be pleased to know that whatever you need, then Eon Drive can help with that. So that's, um, that's the first question that we commonly get asked. Uh, the second question that we commonly get asked is, uh, is my site suitable to support the charging of electric vehicles? So having identified how your fleet operates and what type of charging assets you need uh, in your workplace. Another question that we get, as I say, is will my site cope with that extra power demand? So uh, what we've developed is a really simple tool uh, called Omni that helps you know how many charging points you need. Um, it optimizes your, uh, it tells you how to optimize or tells us how to optimize your existing grid connection to maximize either the speed of charging or the volume of charging points um, and provides an indicative budget quote based on our standard assumptions. So that's a nice little tool that helps fleet managers and energy managers and finance colleagues decide on the business case for EV charging, whether that's funded by you or with some capex contribution from us. So that's the, the first question and very much related to that uh, is a question about, well, if we do need uh, to put in all these EV charging points, uh, how can we avoid expensive grid upgrades? Well, that Omni tool will give you a, an idea of uh, what the impact might be, um, but we also have some other innovative uh, solutions too. So, for example, we have an artificial intelligence tool that we call Eon Hero that manages in real time peak demand uh, across your site and it truly understands what your actual peak demand is rather than taking your worst case scenario and booking that extra capacity with the DNO, which frankly is expensive. So that's uh, Eon Hero. And as I say, it negates the need uh, to, um, uh, to book your worst case demand with the DNO, which is expensive. So, uh, so that's Eon Hero. Um, another innovation that we've got is um, something, you know, that our work place charging points combined uh, with our platform uh, 
that we operate, the software behind all of this, enables to um, activate a feature called dynamic load management, where we can manage the load, yes, between the charging points themselves, um, but also we can manage the, the load of the building and the site that they're installed on. So that mean, it means in, in lay, lay person terms, in practical terms, that we can turn up or turn down the speed of charging at any given moment within your grid uh, constraints. Uh, and of course, we all have VIP guests too. Uh, it could be the chief exec uh, or it could be a really important customer. Uh, so uh, we can then ensure that we provide more capacity, a quicker speed, for example, to that charging point to enable a really premium charging experience for that VIP. Uh, so there's a couple of things that we can do here, um, but the other thing that we can do is uh, we've got some really innovative um, uh, assets. The, the, the charging point on your screen is a product, it's an ultra-fast charging point that we developed with VW, and it's got an integrated uh, battery in it. So the battery is, uh, is constantly, that's connected to the grid, and is constantly charging the asset up at 40 kilowatt hours, so that reduces the need um, for expensive grid upgrades, but from a driver and a customer experience, we're discharging power at around 200 kilowatts, and that's then being constantly topped up um, at 40 kilowatts. Uh, so that's a really, um, uh, really interesting product, and we'll be launching that uh, with our first local authority next year uh, in the UK. So there's a whole range of um, options to help you manage your grid constraints from artificial intelligence tools to dynamic load management, taking into account uh, any VIP guests that you might have, and some really innovative products um, such as the, uh, the Eon Booster product that we've got here. And of course, related to that is vehicle to grid. So vehicle to grid um, is also a really good uh, mechanism to manage your grid capacity uh, whilst improving site resilience, whilst reducing your overall energy costs, and whilst reducing your carbon em emissions. Uh, and we've been working uh, with Nissan and the National Grid and two DNOs funded by Innovate UK to work out uh, how we do uh, uh, commercial vehicle to grid in the UK. So what is uh, vehicle to grid uh, in a nutshell? Well, essentially what we're doing is we're able to um, aggregate all of the spare battery uh, capacity, all of the spare kilowatt hours in your in your batteries that are parked up. And we, we add up all of those kilowatt hours and we put them through what we call our virtual power plant. And there we've got, let's say we've got combined uh, a megawatt or two megawatts of battery capacity. We can then make that available to the national grid. And if there is an occasion, an event, as we call it, where um, the grids need some extra power, then rather than uh, burning fossil fuels and, and using big peaking plants to provide that extra capacity, instead we take your um, spare kilowatt hours in your vans and we provide them to the national grid. And uh, for that, our customers are compensated uh, quite healthily. So it's a great revenue stream, uh, it provides a service to the national grid, uh, but of course, on a on the site level, uh, what it also means uh, is that uh, it can improve your own site resilience, and we call that vehicle to building. And so, if there are any uh, particular grid constraints um, on your local site, again, it's the same sorts of principle. In essence, we can take the kilowatt hours from your batteries uh, and improve uh, grid capacity on a site level too. Uh, it's particularly useful if you've got a back to base fleet um, uh, charge parked up and charging during those peak hours uh, between 4 p.m and 7 p.m uh, that's the ideal scenario uh, but um, um but it works uh, for um, for all types of fleets uh, as long as you've got a vehicle to grid uh, charging point and an eligible vehicle um, so we're also able to subsidise this type of infrastructure. So there's 50% grants available uh, from Innovate UK. And Eugene's our uh, business development manager on Vehicle to Grid, and I'm sure he'll be pleased to, uh, to take your phone calls afterwards. There you go, Eugene, a quick plug for you. Uh, so as we come to a close, 
just to um, perhaps uh, provide you with a, a full view of how we add value uh, from a e-mobility perspective and helping you uh, uh, electrify your fleet. So uh, we acquired energy uh, this year and because of that we're able to manufacture our own charging points which means from a, a customer perspective uh, we can be uh, more price competitive and we can innovate much more easily from a hardware uh, side of things. Uh, we install and we maintain our charging points using our own internal delivery teams and really what we found there was again was great value for money for uh, for you the customer um, it meant we uh, we have much better control over really important matters like health and safety uh, but we found that our MPS scores really rocketed and our MPS customer satisfaction score is plus 66. One of the big ticket features though is that we uh, are able to offer customers uh, options around opening your workplace charging to the public and that means that we can create revenue streams for you and of course uh, as a charge point operator anything that goes wrong uh, with the with with the asset even at two o'clock in the morning we're able to to resolve those uh, because we've got a 24 7 uh, operation here at eon drive so uh, so really we're able to, um, uh, to to manufacture to install and to maintain and, and to, to look after drivers uh, 24 7 um, and as we come to a close it's probably also important as i say to think about electricity supply so we're proud to say that we divested all our fossil fuel assets in 2016 and we only supply 100 percent renewable electricity as a default to all of our home and small medium sized businesses with uh, large corporates having the option so we can do really great things as well around that electricity supply like smart charging and, and that's really like the economy seven of EV, so enabling you to charge when it's cheapest or when it's greenest or a combination of both. And of course, if you uh, need other energy solutions like solar or battery storage, uh, for example, then we can help with that. So just to conclude then, a reminder that we've traveled from Paris in 2015, where the world committed to limiting global emissions uh, global warming to no more than one and a half to two degrees Celsius by 2050. Now that led to a commitment by the UK to decarbonise by 2050, with many cities wanting to go a step further and do so on a local level by 2030. But of course 28% of all those greenhouse gas emissions come from transport and that's the biggest sector uh, responsible for emissions in the UK. And that's prompted a number of policy initiatives to get to net zero by 2050. And of course, that led to the, the big announcement last week to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. So electrifying your fleet will help you reduce your scope one emissions. Uh, and if you, uh, if you supply those vehicles with 100% renewable electricity, then you can decrease your scope two emissions as well. And with a good leadership position and good sustainable procurement policies, then it's, it's possible to really dent your scope three emissions too. And reducing your transport emissions by electrifying your fleet is good for your customers and it's good for your colleagues uh, and it's good commercially too. So it's a win <coughs> all round. And whether you uh, need electric vehicle charging at home, at work or on the go, then we would be pleased uh, to help you with that. So I'll hand over to uh, Eugene now, and I believe we've got time for some questions and answers. Um, uh, just a reminder that uh, climate change uh, is, along with air pollution, two of the biggest challenges facing the world today. And if you would like us to uh, help you electrify your fleet or even talk about um, how we can help you uh, reduce your energy demand on site and increase your amount of renewable generation or battery storage, then we would be pleased to help you with that. So, Eugene, over to you. Thank you, Darren. Really comprehensive overview on how you can become net zero net um, by 2030 and how you can electrify your fleet. And hopefully has provided everybody on the call today um, with the inspiration or ideas on how to achieve scopes one and scope two emissions. 
Now, as, as Darren alluded to, this concludes the end of the webinar today. In a second, we will answer some of your questions that have been submitted throughout the webinar. Before that, as you can see on the screen, we'd like to remind you that we have other webinars um, in Making Net Zero series, which we'll be delighted to share with you. If you, if you would like access to these webinar series, then please email eonwebinar at the bottom of the screen, eonwebinars at eonenergy.com.